Hey, thanks for coming. I'm Martinez. This is Daniel. Uh, there is Anton. So we all work on Cilium, which back in the day used to be just a BPF based container networking plugin for Kubernetes. But since then, it evolved into standalone load balancer, egress gateway, service mesh, product, and so on. And the reason I'm mentioning Cilium is that. All the performance work, Vitagraph performance work, was triggered by its usage. And yes, yeah, so some historical context. So in 2019, at, at Linux Plumbers in Lisbon, we presented our load balancer for Cilium, BPF-based one for east, west, north, south traffic, L4 traffic. And basically, after that presentation, we started looking into implementing more advanced use cases for the load balancer. And one was adding encryption. So on the slide, you can see the very typical north-south packet path, like node one gets a request, which needs to be load balanced. The BPF program, either at the XDP layer or TC layer, does the decision, picks the uh, load balancer application, and then forwards the packet to the destination node. And the problem is that that packet is being forwarded in the clear text, and some users might want to encrypt it, like depending on the underlying network, which they might not trust. And back then we had, uh, in Cilium, we had the IPsec integration, but unfortunately, it was relying on the host networking stack to do the encryption, so on the IP transformation uh, framework in the kernel. So in order to encrypt this packet from the BPF program, you have to pass it to the stack, then IP transformation policies will pick the packet, do the encryption, and then we need to recircle packet back to the BPF program. So we cannot just do the BPF redirect to encrypt the packet. And also, it the integration relies a lot on the TC index and SKB mark, and both are very scarce resources in Cilium because we tend to encode our state there. And also, uh, we didn't have any like key rotation back then, so we started looking into alternatives, and one of them was Vitagard, and Back then, we had some experience with VitaGuard because we were running in the CI to test Cilium's L2 to L3 and L3 to L2 NetDev redirection. And basically, we tried, started to look into that integration. And yeah, it turned to be fairly simple compared to the IPsec. And mainly because with the VitaGuard, you have a dedicated a network device to which you can just redirect the packet and that network device will do the encryption and you can attach the BPF programs to ingress and egress. And we decided, yeah, to add it to Cilium and the integration turned to be a very like simple, like that simple. So each Cilium agent generates uh, pri public private keys. Public keys are being exchanged between uh, different nodes managed by Cilium, and then Cilium creates the VireGuard uh, network device, sets it by using the generated public key with the private key, and also adds the basically the list of endpoints, which are the container IPs, and that's it. So the packet path for the container to container uh, traffic is that the VIV device from the VIV device in which, uh, to which we attach the BPF program, we can redirect to F0 uh, network device. And on that network device, we have a BPF program and that program can decide whether a packet needs to be encrypted. And then we pass to the VitaGuard device, it encrypts, sets the SKB mark again forwards to the if 0 In if 0 we check whether the mark is being set because otherwise, if we pass it back to the VitaGuard device, we'll end up in a loop. And then we pass to the remote node, the packet is encrypted, and it's very similar on the receiving, receiving side. And basically, back then, the VitaGuard in the kernel, 
it was fairly new citizen. Uh, it was upstreamed in 5.6 kernel and in Cilium we supported 4.9 kernel. So we added the user space integration, but we never considered it being very serious because yeah, it's running in the user space. So it might have a very bad performance compared to the internal implementation and also yeah, like stuff like uh, Cilium uh, control plane restart, uh, restarting might uh, cause some packet uh, interruptions. And yeah, uh, basically the performance thing was the main uh, thing. And then, yeah, we said like, okay, just experimental code, but then some blog post appeared. So passing to Daniel. Yeah, uh, so in April last year, actually, there was a blog post from Tailscale folks. Uh, they were using wire.go and they basically showcased how they improved the performance of it. So this got us quite interested. So basically what they were doing, um, they were leveraging UDP GSO and GRO. Um, the whole thing goes through a ton uh, device. And yeah, the implementation is basically in Go. And they managed to improve the performance uh, in their blog post, which they described from around eight gigabit per second to 13. And uh, the com in comparison from what they saw, like from the kernel, it was around 11. So they basically managed to overtake, which uh, yeah, which got us uh, interested to look a bit deeper into it, whether, you know, like whether there's low hanging fruit initially to um, uh, potentially improve something on the, on the kernel side as well. Um, so yeah, we recently only started recently looking into this. So basically we did a um, benchmark back to back 100 gigabit connect x uh, six NICs from Anox. Um, couple of uh, tunings uh, for reference for future reference here. And yeah, so basically that's what we got like uh, bare metal back to back in the host namespace uh, with the standard MTU of 1500 uh, without any encryption, we are around 46 gigabit per second. Uh, with the WireGuard Go driver, we managed to get 8 gigabit and the kernel just like 5.7, which is not really great. We also looked into this in, in terms of higher, like increasing the MTU. Uh, so using an 8K MTU, uh, we basically managed to get like the, as a baseline, 72 gigabit per second. And the native um, driver in the kernel actually looks better here. So we actually got to 20 gigabit. Um, in, in comparison for the wire got go, it, it was around 15 gigabit per second. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, the transaction per second, uh, what we found was that the native driver has a, a higher TPS than the than the wire got go, like on smaller MTUs and very similar also on the on the larger one. Um, so the question is, yeah, can, is there something we can do better? Uh, so looking into the, into the WireGuard, uh, code, basically, you know, how, how it does like in terms of GIA or GSO, this is probably the obvious candidates to look into first. Um, the GSO, it's basically, there's nothing registered from, from the driver point of view. So basically once, once the, once the packet arrive on the, on the physical NIC, uh, it will try to geo aggregate, but there's no callback or something like this. So it, the packets will go up the stack uh, individually. Um, and once they uh, hit the WireGuard UDP socket, um, WireGuard then decrypts, and then it, it will try to aggregate to NAPI geo receive, and then it will, it will go up as a batch. In terms of GSO, um, the kernel stack basically will send a big packet down and once it uh, hits the WireGuard device, the WireGuard uh, will basically do the uh, software segmentation so that it will create individual packets and then after it, it did that, it will encrypt them. And one of the reasons why is because you cannot just um, duplicate the headers because in the protocol there's a counter or, or nonce for replay protection. so. Uh, yeah, that's why um, the, there's the, the reason to, to call the SKB GSO segment first. Um, 
So yeah, in in terms of potentially low hanging fruit, we looked at the um, yeah at the Stefan's um, ESP offload, uh, which is uh, yeah basically the the idea is to register a GRO callback from the UDP socket, and we looked at the at the XFM, XFM code in terms of how it would do the GRO aggregation and, it, and what it basically does is. Um, it uh, you know steals the packet from the GRO engine um, and decrypts them and then aggregates them and then pushes them up as a like as a batch. Uh, so that's on the GRO side. On the on the GSO side, uh, we try to to add the the big TCP like flag to to enable it to see whether this helps in 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 some way. Um, in terms of the implementation, which is probably a little bit hard to see here, but yeah, we, we are basically registering a GRO handler, and when we see data packets, we are we are pushing them right into the queue uh, that WireGuard has for the decryption, and then stealing it from the from the GRO engine, which is bas basically done through the return code with E in progress, um, which tells the GRO engine that it's consumed. Um, and then once it's decrypted, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's the uh, NAPI GO um, uh, ag aggregation, and it will push it up the, the stack. Uh, one thing for discussion um, in the uh, in the ESP offload, it's basically done through a kconfig, um, and it actually turns out that seems to be enabled. Uh, by default in distributions, at least in Ubuntu, I, I double checked uh, whether it would be useful um, for the WireGuard at least to have it as a device attribute um, because it changes the behavior uh, for, uh, for the stack. Because for example, um, if you would run TCP dump, that might not be visible on the physical device anymore because the um, GO happens earlier. Um, or through a sysctl, I'm not sure. Like probably more useful as a as an attribute in the device, and or kconfig whether we should do something similar or yeah. Uh, if anyone has opinions, I'm <laughs> happy to hear. Um, okay. Uh, so looking at the. Uh, NetPerf TCP stream uh, for the 1500 MTU. Um, the combination together gives a small improvement, uh, 15%. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's still less than what the uh, WireGuard Go implementation has in, in the user space, um, but probably worth it um, to, to uh, you know, submit. In, in the case of the 8K MTU, what, what we saw is that the L2-based GOO actually gives, you know, also like slightly better uh, performance improvement. The big TCP enabled as a second step, um, it's slightly worse. Um, but yeah, overall, like, uh, there are some things to, to, to get out of. In terms of the transaction per second, yeah, it it's, it's, uh, helps a little bit. So, yeah, this this was basically for the for the single flow. Then the next question was, what about multiple parallel flows, right? Because uh, as Martinez mentioned earlier, like Cilium creates a single WireGuard device, and then all the east-west traffic from the pods they get pushed through that device. So the yeah, it was. Uh, Question is, how does it perform here? Um, and yeah, it turns out not great <laughs> uh, because there's no RSS scaling. Like if you look at the packets on the wire, uh, the source and destination ports, they are like basically the ports that you configure on the WireGuard device when you create it. So they all look the same. So all basically hit um, one CPU and um, doesn't scale very well. Uh, so we are basically stuck around like 25 gigabit uh, per second for just like four or five streams. It doesn't get better, it rather gets worse. Um, 
so the question was um, if there's anything that we could do to improve, um, at least maybe based on without changing anything. So the idea was, okay, can we create uh, multiple devices and then have them under a, a bond, for example, and the multiple devices, they would have same config, um, just different uh, listen ports so that you can actually distribute the traffic across uh, different CPUs on the receiver. But it turns out, um, yeah, like for the for the bond, it's not possible <laughs> because uh, it would ex it expects an L2 device where I got is L3. Um, there's like one trivia. There's a missing set MAC address. But even if you implement like a dummy one, so there's definitely more more work needed to support something uh, like that. So like out of the box, um, yeah, didn't get it to work. Generally, it would be nice because you just have a single device. So, like from a BPF point of view, you don't need to. Uh, you, 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 it would just be like a drop-in replacement. But yeah, it's currently not possible, at least uh, without extending bond um, one way or another. Um, yeah, the other idea was to have multiple WireGuard devices and then like load balance through multiple um, next hops. So, from a from a routing point of view, that that works to configure. But then the problem is WireGuard itself. Uh, so it turns out that um, somehow there is a bug inside the WireGuard driver that we are still need to fix uh, because the allowed IPs, for example, if you if you have all of them the the same across different devices, they get overwritten. Like so like some, um, basically um, suddenly the it, it will be visible on one device, but on all the other devices, they will basically replace with none so that it will drop all the incoming traffic. <laughs> um, so that's something that still needs to be done. Um, so yeah, what, like, what about different um, listen ports and different key pairs? I mean, it will end up in the same situation, so that was not possible. Uh, so just to see whether uh, the idea would bring something um, basically, what we did is like to completely, you know, configure all different I IPs so that there's no conflict across, um, among the different devices. So, um, yeah, looking into the performance of that, like for the for the parallel streams, um, yeah, it, it it gives quite a bit. So like 70% better uh, throughput in total uh, when it's uh, you know load balance across the different CPUs. So that's definitely something worth uh, following up. Um, similar, there's um, improvement uh, for the transactions per second for the TCP RR uh, based workload. So yeah. Um, some of the other findings that we had while, while testing, uh, what you can see here is a flame graph. And actually, in the uh, the WireGuard basically calls SQB copy and write data in, in on shortly before the decryption because it will do the decryption in line, and it will then call PSKB expand head and internally it will uh, you know clear the pages and it turns out um, uh, that this is actually something I missed earlier like while while doing the benchmarking that's something that seems to be enabled by default on all the distros. Uh, and yeah, thanks to Eric for the hint. <laughs> so basically, that's a, like a hardening kernel hardening setting, which initializes all the allocations by default um, in the kernel. So like this is even you know slightly more or like as expensive as the decryption itself. So um, like the promise <laughs> that's like for synthetic workloads as high as seven percent is, is I would say not quite accurate, um, but. I, I didn't manage to um, uh, measure, like remeasure, before I got here, uh, but it's something to to look into and maybe like also to have something to opt out if we know that we are overriding this data anyway. Um, so yeah, I think like as a as a next step, what would be really useful is to potentially have a new mode in WireGuard where we can say that we want to hash the source port with the actual tuple from the from the inner packet, and 
use that as a as a source port instead of like the listener port. Um, so this would basically you know expose the, the the hash, but on the other hand, you would you would be able to make use of RSS, and I don't think it would be a big uh, um, a big issue to expose that. Um, that would assume that you would only have like a uh, potentially, yeah, like a like a single device uh, on on each node, so similar, very similar to what the the way that Reaxlan would would do it, um, but it would probably be have to be a, a new mode so that because it would not be backwards compatible with the with the current one with the current implementation. Um, then uh, another thing uh, that uh, would be useful to experiment with, so there's this. Uh, multi-core crypto operation where you basically, I mean, this, this is very visible when doing the NetPerf performance benchmark. So when you do a TCP stream and pin the sender and receiver to a single CPU, you can see on the, uh, that basically all CPUs get busy, right? So that uh, that's a scheme that was implemented in the driver to you know distribute the decryption among different CPUs. Um, but it would be interesting to experiment whether you know, like I would assume, like all the caching and and, and everything, it, it might be more beneficial to just stick with a single CPU. It might also simplify the implementation uh, potentially. Um, and once we have the RSS, uh, yeah, that would should hopefully um, improve the performance even further. Um, some 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 other things. Um, the what what can be done here, and, and I think um, there hasn't been too much work in that area yet, is also the the, the cache link groups for uh, the receive and transmit, um, and for scaling among um, lots of flows. There's actually an atomic counter which is shared across different CPUs, which is currently on the per peer uh, queue internally that the uh, WireGuard has. So that seems to be also in a a point of contention, um, yeah. So those are like some of the next steps we we will try to experiment with um, to improve the performance of the driver. And yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Are there any question, comments, uh, feedback, other ideas? I have a question. So the, for the GSO, you're saying you're breaking up the packets? It's not doing GSO out under. The yeah, it's it's basically segmenting inside the driver. So like the the big packet comes to the wire guard and then it's it's doing but, that. So the nonces are part of the payload, right? And it's GS is UDP segmentation. So as long as you maintain the right format inside the payload, you can do the same thing as Quick is doing. The packets I like, the packets are the same size, right? So yeah, you can just um like inject in between the frames the space for the headers to the crypto mm. and ship them as one. OK. Yeah, we'll take, we'll take a look if that's possible. Any questions? I saw some of this. I suggest uh, to take a look at uh, Virtual Net in QEMO because uh, we already have eBPF uh, classifier for RSS. And actually, Akihiko, who is here now on uh, the conference, is working uh, <clears throat> to push some kernel patches to have the hash reporting for uh, kind of general network devices. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it will help what you're doing. So probably good okay. idea to cooperate. We also have uh, not GRO, but rather RSC, which is kind of Windows specific code inside of QMU that uh, aggregates the packets, so it also might be useful. Mm. Okay, yeah, thanks for the pointer. Just wanted to uh, understand how did you compare the KTLS instead of using the WireGuard here? No, we didn't look at KTLS. On that? What? Any thoughts on that? So, sorry. A any thoughts on that? Like, why not KTLS instead of WireGuard? I mean, like the. I mean, for the KTLS, you would have to have, you know, like uh, um, opt-in support for the specific applications. But we basically just wanted, I mean, this to be transparent and for all the pod traffic that goes east to west. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's like 
apple and oranges i would say like to to uh, yeah <laughs> I, I happen to know of someone who's trying to do the same thing with Jake. Okay. Um, but on the, uh, I, what I wanted to say was the, uh, the crypto fan out thing that you were talking about. Um, I, I believe it's there to optimize for single flow throughput, right? Yeah. And obviously you have running, you're multiplexing a lot of traffic across, uh, of different flows across a single device. And then you're probably right. It would be, it would make a lot more sense to just inside WireGuard just treat each uh, lower level flow or upper level flow individually and not do the fan out. Um, but then that is going to regress single flow throughput, which people want. So I suspect it may have to be like a different deployment mode or something and require quite a bit of, of surgery to get rid of. Um, but that could also be an option. Having, actually, having two different yeah. Right. Actually, just before the the break, I was talking with Stefan. You you mentioned that the WireGuard actually took this as an inspiration from XFRM, but later on you you got rid of it, right? So m maybe you can comment uh, <laughs> about it. <laughs> yeah. So just that pan out was good as long as crypto was much more expensive than um, pinning um, packets to CPU. That change we have ASNI and crypto is rather cheap and now so pinning the packets to different CPUs eats up um, the benefit we get from uh, most of our yeah. so that's mm. why we in the new like stack. So what we're now doing is we are pinning the crypto context to each CPU and so we can just uh, send the packets through independently. And the encryption decryption happens on the local CPU, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just a thought here. Uh, have you considered abusing IPv6 flow label for fan out? <laughs> yeah, I've heard the suggestion as well. The problem is like, unfortunately in the real world, like the users we are dealing with, they are all on IPv4, which is very sad, but that's the reality. Understandable. <laughs> but yeah, that, that would be another option. I agree. I agree. So I was playing with um, other IPsec implementations and I didn't get uh, results as good as yours. Uh, I was testing with uh, in a VM, so host to host. So have you tried to test on VMs? No. All right. Another question is, um, I got the impression that you are doing encryption on the CPU. Have you tried or considered uh, offloading it to the NIC? I don't think there are offloads available, at least not to my knowledge. Okay. For WireGuard, yeah. For WireGuard, okay. Yeah. Uh, there is actually a WireGuard offload available okay. uh, for <laughs> FPGAs, and it's open source on GitHub. But that's very hardware specific okay. and not Linux kernel specific. You need to go by FG FPGA, yes. Exactly. <laughs> um, have you, I mean, certainly not an easy task, but have you considered doing the actual crypto from, triggered from BPF directly? I mean, since we have now the crypto API and BPF? I mean, I haven't. I mean, <laughs> but, but it would. Hmm? <laughs> not at all? Even? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, the, the, the other idea was also to uh, make it useful and, and fa faster, like by default outside of BPF, right? I mean, like. <laughs> hmm? but, I mean, like the, the, the rationale to uh, improve it and look further into that, like into improving the driver is to make it useful also without having to use BPF, right? So yeah. basically, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, thanks.